So I'm very pleased to uh, participate in the fourth African American Economic Summit. Uh, the first three summits were jointly co-sponsored by the Research Network on Racial and Ethnic Inequality with uh, other, other units. Uh, the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hills Institute for African American Research was our co-sponsor for summits one and two. And the Joint Center for Political and Economic Studies was the co-sponsor for uh, for summit number three. Now uh, I'm thrilled to be uh, participating in summit four with Howard University as the, the primary sponsor of this event. Uh, it's very exciting. Uh, I'm also pleased to have other members of the research network on racial and ethnic inequality here with, with me. You'll be hearing from Rhonda Sharp, who is our research director later today. And uh, you'll also be hearing from Margaret Gale, who is the progenitor of Project Bright Idea, and also uh, Jackie Terrell, our administrative managers here. Uh, I'd like to open this panel by making an observation about yesterday's USA Today, which had a cover article that was called Dip in Economy Not So Bad. And it uh, was essentially an op optimistic read on the trajectory of the US economy, despite the negative 0.1% growth rate last quarter. And I would submit that this article is a testament to how far our standards have fallen for performance of the economy. We've, our, our, our expectations and standards have been battered downward by the force of the Great Recession. I would like to also submit that we remain in a deep economic crisis. Wages still are falling. The wage share is the lowest percentage of gross domestic product on record. Corporate profits are at their highest share of uh, gross domestic product on record. 20 million people report desiring full-time work. 12 million people are out of work. Poverty has risen to levels unseen since the start of the war on poverty in the 1960s, and one third of the individuals who are classified as poor are persons who are at work. So related to this is the fact that the jobs that are being created by the job creators are hugely unsatisfactory. One quarter of jobs in America pay less than the federal poverty line for a family of four. Many new jobs are temporary and insecure, and as a consequence, have no benefits associated with them. Over the last three years, it's the temporary industry that's added more jobs in the United States than any other. Data from the American Staffing Association, which is the trade group for temporary recruitment agencies, demonstrates precisely that fact. In fact, one could argue that low-wage temporary jobs are threatening to become the norm in the US economy. Nearly one half of all American college graduates in 2010 were underemployed, holding jobs requiring less than a bachelor's degree. Indeed, an example is Teresa Vales, a 45-year-old single woman. I should also add she's a single white woman who owns a home in North Durham. She uh, is not a particularly extravagant individual. Uh, apparently, she owns a 2003 Toyota Corolla that has long since been paid. Uh, she has an old wardrobe that has not been updated in five or six years. She estimates that she needs about $2,800 a month to maintain herself, but she's already depleted most of $10,000 in savings and relies upon a weekly unemployment check that is about $522. Now, the state of North Carolina, where, where we live, is, is one where, uh, at the present moment, individuals can have 26 weeks of eligibility for unemployment insurance, but our newly elected state legislature is in the process of trying to reduce that period of eligibility to 12 weeks. Now, this particular woman, Teresa Vales, has a master's degree in biology and biomedical sciences from Emory University. She joined, she joined a Durham biotech firm in 2010 and earned about $56,000 a year until she was laid off in January 2012. Subsequently, she's applied for 150 jobs, several with salaries much less than what she previously earned. 
She's garnered 20 interviews, but no jobs. So she has been unemployed for two consecutive years. And I would also argue that the fact that we know about her case is somewhat surprising because individuals who are highly educated and unemployed tend to underreport their joblessness status. And so in our official statistics, I would argue that we have a, an underestimate, underestimate of the number of individuals who are unemployed in the more highly educated strata of the population. Now the overall American unemployment rate is currently estimated to be about 7.8%. However, we have a persistent phenomenon of stigmatized populations being subjected to job discrimination and exclusion from employment at much higher rates than the national average. So for example, um, in the most recent data that we have, the white unemployment rate in the United States was 6.8%, but the black rate was 13.2%. And I would also contend that uh, Bernie Anderson is a little bit wrong in one of the comments that, she, that he made a little earlier, even though I was, I was, I was thrilled to, to see him aggressively argue that we need to address the problem of racial disparity in America, finally, under a black president. Yeah, okay. So, um, but, he, but he was wrong in saying that the differential in unemployment rates is smaller at higher levels of education. In fact, the unemployment rate for blacks is twice as high as that of whites at each level of educational attainment. And in 2011, the unemployment rate for blacks with some college education was higher than the rate for whites with no high school diploma. Okay, let me repeat that. The unemployment rate for blacks with some college education was higher than the rate for whites with, who had not finished high school. Okay, so from my perspective, the two to one gap in unemployment, which prevails at all levels of educational attainment, is one of the central indices that we have of the persistence of the degree of discrimination in the economy. Other groups that are stigmatized that suffer from high unemployment rates Ex-offenders who may be encountering rates as high as 20 to 30 percent. And these are ex-offenders. These are individuals who have completed their, uh, their sentences. They, they have a tremendous amount of difficulty finding work. But another group that may be somewhat surprising in this category is, is military veterans, young male veterans in particular in the 18 to 24 year age category. In 2011, they suffered an unemployment rate of close to 30%. This is higher than the young male non-veteran unemployment rate, which is in the, was in the vicinity of 17.6%. Now, I'm going to propose, as I have many times, <laughs> that we adopt a federal job guarantee for good times and bad times a permanent and universal program that I've been putting under the label of the National Investment Employment Corps. This program would provide a minimum salary of $20,000 plus benefits, including medical insurance and a portable pension plan for all employees of this public sector employment program. We would use a decentralized mechanism for identifying the tasks to be performed by canvassing the states and municipalities. And in effect, what we could do is merge our anti-poverty mission with our employment mission. That is a full employment mission by using a mechanism of direct job creation rather than attempting to indirectly produce full employment by a variety of stimulus packages. And uh, Representative Scott, your concerns about our capacity to finance these programs would be completely addressed by the fact that we're merging the anti-poverty mission with the employment mission. And I'll, I'll come to that in a moment. What are the types of jobs that could be performed under such a program? The American physical infrastructure, which is in sharp decay, could be addressed by putting people to work on our roads and bridges, by developing and extending our rapid transit systems, by repairing and maintaining our school facilities, by introducing uh, a quality public sector childcare program, 
by training people to provide computer repair and upgrade services, by having teams of workers who are prepared to go into disaster areas immediately and deal with emergencies, to renovate and restore our ailing postal service system. We could structure the program in such a way that we had incentives, including job ladders, so that people could advance within the National Investment Employment Corps. We could have a training component. Now, let me, let me be clear here. I do not believe that people are out of work because there is a skills mismatch issue. There is a shortage of employment at all skill levels. People are not out of work because they are unproductive. They are unproductive because they are out of work. What we can do with this proposal is put America back to work at full employment through the direct provision of new jobs. For example, if we put 15 million people to work at an approximate cost of $50,000 per person, the program would cost approximately $750 billion. We could then replace our nexus of anti-poverty and unemployment insurance programs all together. In 2011, the combination of welfare, food stamps, Medicaid, Pell Grants, and 80 other federal programs of income support was approximately $746 billion. So to put 15 million people to work at a cost of approximately $50,000 per person would be exactly the equivalent of the expenses that were undertaken in 2011 to try to cover the needs of our population that is impoverished. Now, what else could be one of the consequences, beneficial consequences of the introduction of a program of a federal job guarantee? Well, we could restore state and municipal tax bases. We could effectively eliminate lousy jobs because the minimum quality job that would have to be uh, provided by the private sector would have to be at least the equivalent of the minimum job that is offered by the public sector. We could stabilize consumption expenditures in the aggregate. We could create a demand for materials and supplies to execute, uh, to execute the infrastructure building which would constitute a de facto stimulus for the private sector. We could eliminate the burden of unemployment insurance taxes for the private sector, especially its debilitating effect for small businesses. And we could provide a, a team of laborers for whom the private sector potentially could share the cost with the public sector uh, out of the National Investment Employment Corps. In short, we could eliminate working poverty and the threat of unemployment and economic insecurity in one full swoop. Now, you may ask me why people are, you know, have not jumped on this plan. And the answer is, I really don't know. Uh, I mean, it, it strikes me that this is the central way to address the current economic crisis, the potential problem of joblessness that people may may incur and experience in good times or prosperous times, and a mechanism for eliminating poverty in America altogether. Let's do it.